you will be drowning, you will be burning in drought, there will be no food, there will be floods. We have only one world. And, and for those who think that the rich are going to escape, I can't remember which American writer it was. I heard him speak and he said uh, that his job is to comfort the disturbed and to disturb the comfortable. Hello, my name is Nate Rankin. Welcome back to the show, to the program, Books You Haven't Read, where it's not so much like a program or a show as much as it is just a thing I do occasionally, sometimes, with no really set schedule. Um, today I am going to be talking about Robert Coover's debut novel, uh, Origin of the Brunists, um, originally published in 1966, uh, that, uh, uh, edition, this edition was republished in, uh, 2015 by Dezonk Books, Dezonk Books, very good, uh, literary press, check them out. Uh, long time, uh, viewers of the show will, uh, note that I have reviewed The Public Burning, I've said it was one of my top ten favorite books of all time. Um, and having read this book now, I feel like I'm getting into the territory where I'm saying that Robert Coover is one of my, you know, favorite five or ten authors of all time. Um, I've read four of his books now, um, and spoiler alerts, I liked this one. Um, and I really, really liked them all. I've given three of the four that I've read five stars. That's this one, Public Burning, of course, and then Universal Baseball Association. Uh, the fourth book that I read is Whatever Happened to Gloomy Gus of the Chicago Bears. I gave that four stars only because I felt like I was still kind of missing something even after I read it, but maybe there's not more to be missed or more to be gotten. I don't know. Maybe I was a bad reader for that book. As for this book, let's go ahead and get into it, right? Um, Origin of the Brunists is about, it's actually based on a real life uh, mine disaster that happened in West Franklin, Illinois, which is around where Robert Coover is from. His dad was a journalist in kind of the next town over um, and covered uh, a mining disaster that occurred in 1951. So a mining disaster occurs and an apocalyptic cult uh, springs up in response to the one survivor among the 98 uh, that were killed. Robert Coover's dad is, I think, loose inspiration for one of the main characters. It's kind of a, a panoplistic novel where we're going through a lot of different um, just characters throughout the town. There's not really one main character, but obviously there are sort of more principal characters than the others. Compared to The Public Burning, it's just very grounded in reality. Um, it shifts through the perspectives of the West Condoners, um, and they have what springs up in response to this mining disaster is this apocalyptic cult that predicts the end of the world that's coming in like the sort of weeks and months after the mining disaster. Um, and it sort of gets it wrong and then says, oh, just kidding, you know, we did the numerology wrong. Uh, it's actually going to happen seven weeks uh, from now. And... Uh, then the ultimate kind of climactic scene is, you know, the day when the world is supposed to end. And it's like a cult of like only a couple dozen or um, so people in town. But of course, word also gets out, thanks in no small part to the uh, Tiger Miller, the, the chief editor of the paper in town that's doing all these uh, different kind of fantastical stories. And, you know, there's... From Miller's perspective, he's like panning this uh, apocalyptic cult, but of course, um, that's not how like the public comes to it or reads it. They see it; it's much more sympathetic and inspiring. Um, so that by kind of the, the very end, it's literally carnival esque um, because someone gets the bright idea to like charge an entry fee to like the field or the hill where you know the the sort of uh, uh, end of the world will occur probably argue it's been this way multiple times in the whatever 50 years since it's 50 60 years a lot of years since it's been published um it's very relevant kind of to today i'm thinking most obviously of something like QAnon, <clears throat> and you know look QAnon is kind of the obvious cult du jour um, but there are also very similar structures or themes to 
kind of the Brunist cult and QAnon. Uh, they both make predictions that don't come true. Um, both of them engage in like kind of a crowdsourcing of prophecies at different points. Um, they each make extremely dubious men like very central to their messiah narratives and then they're both fundamentally syncretic you know so they uh blend and try to reconcile you know these uh conflicting ideologies one of which is eleanor norton's sort of vaguely uh astrological belief or cosmogony um that is sort of headed by a spirit called demiran um and he's at its center in eleanor um hears his voice making sort of these very vague cryptic prophecies um and then she sets about trying to interpret them. Eleanor and her husband, by the way, have gotten kicked out of like virtually every little small town that they've lived in in the Midwest through like, you know, the 10 years leading up to this book. She has this kind of habit of she's sort of known to be like this corrupter of youth. She basically tries to spread her spread her Demiran beliefs to um, young teenage boys like or older high school boys, I should say. I'm unsure if the implication is that it's a grooming thing, but it feels so obvious that I feel like I missed the expl explication of that actually happening. The whole astrology side from Eleanor Norton's uh, background is forced to reconcile with a more um, kind of, I'll call it garden variety Christian millenarianism, um, where it's, you know, basically the book of Revelation stuff, like kind of the center of that the uh, theology is coming from end times are coming imminently type of stuff. And then there's also a little bit, there's a guy named Ralph Heimbaugh, um, who is like an amateur numerologist. Um, again, that kind of aligns more with Eleanor's type of stuff. Um, but with all of this, like you see a familiar stew of conspiracism that's very um, apparent, I would say, in our current day and age. And I think there's something... Um, you know, weirdly comforting about how contemporary all of it actually feels. Uh, the other big contemporary connection I felt like was in the media's relationship to what was happening. Uh, because that was like very Trumpian to me, right? Like specifically Tiger Miller and uh, the West Condon Chronicle, which he's the editor in chief of. Uh, because of his sensationalistic coverage of the event, uh, he ended up elevating people who were dangerous and out of control. And it ended up becoming a broader phenomenon because the bullhorn of like syndication spread it around. It was a fascinating story that sold well, and so Tiger kept on kind of pumping out these stories about it. Um, and that's not really like an exclusive to Trump thing. I don't want to pretend like he's the only media figure who's tried to create a circus. But that's kind of the lesson um, in all of this for me, is that things aren't quite as unique to your own moment um, as you think. It just sort of happens in different degrees and contexts. Uh, it's also interesting how this book like takes place amidst the like deindustrialization of a town because we talk a lot about of the effects of that like in our current uh, political moment, but this was um, you know, it's funny because this book takes place in the early 50s, as I mentioned. Um, in a time when you don't normally think of maybe as a deindustrialized moment, you think of that as like being the boom of industrialized America. But in this specific town, you know, the main industry is coal mining. And when the mine exploded, because of the poor machinery and oversight and the owners decide they don't want to open back up, you get a small scale sociological uh, version of what happens for years and years across, you know, the whole country. And there's an extra ratchet of desperation as you kind of go on in years. One of the things I've consistently loved, not just in this book, but across um, Coover's uh, oeuvre, I guess, uh, is his writing. Um, he has this kind of vernacular Americanness to it, um, or that's you know what I think is meant to be conveyed. He obviously has a recognizable style, but it can range through different types of books. Whether it's like self-conscious metafiction of Universal Baseball Association, he works it into there, um, or if it's you know absurdist historical fabulisms like the Public Burning, which is very pop culture savvy um, and very kind of of its moments, literally to the days um, that it exists, or if it's like this book, um, which is more like, and here I'm going to 
invoke a book that I've never read before, but that I feel like this book is probably like Winesburg, Ohio, um, you know, which is about a small rural town, um, kind of a series of it's not really this one isn't really a series of short stories. I know Winesburg, Ohio is sometimes thought of as a novel, sometimes thought of as like a collection of short stories. Anyway, um, I think it's really impressive how, you know, he can do something with a really distinct and kind of definable voice, but also do it very differently across very different types of books. So I really like that. Um, I think some authors, you know, get trapped in their voice to the point where they can only write, you know, novels or one kind of novel, cough, Brett Easton Ellis, cough. Um, but Coover can, like I said, sort of do that, 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 uh, that that mix you can do that variety of styles and um, I don't know I think that's kind of rare for my tastes you know and more specifically it's funny how he can make um, a lot of there are a lot of I would say brutal acts of humanity um, in this book and he makes them seem like so lyrical and prosaic um, and he often does them in like a really subtle language uh, climactic moments are told uh, almost too casually, just enough to where you wonder whether, like, Coover is trying to hide something from you. It's his way of, you know, making sure you're paying attention. One of the things that I remember liking about Gloomy Gus, even though it's easily the book I've had the most trouble with uh, Coover-wise, despite the fact that it's also the thinnest, um... Uh, but one of the things that I most liked about it was what I termed kind of its encyclopedic lyricism. Um, he's, I really think Coover's kind of this interesting split right down the middle of uh, kind of a guy, say, like uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald and Thomas Pynchon. Um, if you can imagine those two guys as like poles of, you know, a certain type of writer, like Robert Coover's kind of in the middle of those two. Um, and that style comes to play in this book because he's able to work both on the psychic and the systematic levels. You know, he's telling you the story both through a variety of personal stories, but he also goes into like a more omniscient sweeping narrative uh, at other points where, you know, he's able to talk about kind of uh, the town's political and economic and media ecosystems um, from a broader view. And there's just a really nice balance. So those are my thoughts. This is as excellent, you know, in a different way as most of the other Coover that I've read. And I'm hoping to read another Coover this year. I've got a couple different ones to choose from. Um, I'll be interested to pick up Brunus Day of Wrath. I'm actually interested if anyone out there has read Brunus Day of Wrath. Let me know what you thought of that. Let me know what you thought about this book if you've read it. Um, but I'm interested if, like, because Brunus Day of Wrath is, like, nearly a thousand pages. So I'm interested if that was, like, maybe a late in life overwritten book or if it, you know, stands up to the original. As an outro, I'm going to read from the opening uh, of this book. I really, really loved that. So there is a prologue, I will say, and then there's the first chapter. That first chapter, um, just in terms of kind of broad scope uh, overlooking you know, a huge amount of people. It's very comparable to the first chapter of Underworld, um, both in terms of like its beauty of writing and also just in kind of how much it's trying, how much ground it's trying to cover. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't. And uh, more videos coming soon. Clouds have massed, doming in the small world of West Condon. The patches of old snow, crusted black with soot and full daylight, now appear to whiten as the sky dulls toward evening. The temperature descends. Slag smoke sours the air. Only eight days since the new year began, but the vague hope its advent traditionally engenders has already gone stale. Schools exhale the young. Not yet convinced they care to take on the hard work of the world, most of them gather and disperse around pool tables and pinball machines, in drugstores, in down at the bus station, or simply on corners. Gangs of youngsters fall upon the luckless eccentrics, those with big ears or short pants or restless egos, and sullen hates are nursed. Rebellious cigarette butts are lit, lit, flicked, ground under heel. Time gets on, seems to run and drag at the same time. People put their minds on supper and the ball game, and talk, talk about anything. Talk and listen to talk. 
smoking cures, the job, better jobs, how dumb the kids are, television, coal mining, the hit parade, indigestion cures, Jews, Arabs, communists, Negroes, colleges, impotence cures, the Holy Spirit, the state tournament, filters, West Condon, West Condoners, mostly that, West Condoners, what's wrong with them, what dumb things they've done, what they've been talking about, what's wrong with the way they talk, who's putting out, jokes they've told, why they're not happy, what's wrong with their home.